Hello and welcome. My name is Suzanne Allen and welcome to your final session of COVID-19 Changing Cultures. Um, Implication to Action, What Now? is the title of this session. Um, I know that you've had a heavy two days. That's been really, really interesting. So I want you to sit down if you're not, have your cup of tea, and uh, but please, please be ready to take part and ask questions. We don't have a lot of time, we have an hour. And so I'm gonna jump right in. I'm gonna tell you a bit about myself. I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves. And then we're going to go straight in to what we're doing. Um, so my name is Suzanne Allen. For those of you that don't know me, I am a cultural thinker. That means I do strategy and research and uh, brand work. And my research is around power. Um, that's enough for me. I will be guiding you through today. I'm going to introduce the speakers one by one, and they're going to tell you very quickly what they do, who they are, and they're going to give you a visual description of themselves. And just to help them along the way, I will start. I'm a black woman with my favorite dress on. Um, I'm sitting in front of a beautiful picture of a piano. I'm wearing red lipstick, and I have see-through glasses. So over to um, our first speaker, Ben Wormsley from University of Leeds. Ben. Thanks, Suzanne, and hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I'm Ben Wormsley. I'm director of the Centre for Cultural Value and the lead researcher on this project. Uh, I'm a white man. I'm going to say I'm in my mid-40s. I'm hanging on there just about. Um, I therefore have uh, very little hair remaining, and I'm wearing my typical black conference shirt today. Um, I have a nice blue background, which actually is called Dance Hall Blue, which I think is really appropriate given all the conversations we've had about pivoting and dancing actually in the last session. So great pleasure to be here and really looking forward to the last session. Thank you very much, Ben. And uh, welcome Dave O'Brien from the University of Edinburgh. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, uh, I'm Dave O'Brien. I'm Chancellor's Fellow in Cultural and Creative Industries at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I'm a white man uh, in the same age band as Ben, um, wearing a similar black shirt, actually, but I'm in front uh, of a room with white walls, which is my, my sitting room. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. Welcome, Anne Torrigiani. Have I pronounced your name right? Well, it's Torrigiani, but frankly, I answer to all of them and I don't really mind. No, 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 no. <laughs> we're going to do specificity here. My so, Torrigiani, yeah. welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Anne, yes, I'm, I'm co-director of the Centre for Cultural Value and um, sort of part-time and, and the chief executive of the Audience Agency Research Partners in the COVID-19 Impact Project and uh, very delighted to have been delivering the Cultural Participation Monitor. Um, I'm a white woman um, and I make up in hair what Ben lacks as my co-director. I have quite a lot of it. It's red, it's long, I've got my glasses on. And actually in the room behind me, I've also got dancing blue, but I'm sitting in my living room and this end of it has got a nice kind of um, pink tone to it. Wow, thank you. So there's definitely a dancing blue theme here going on. Um, you, you, I will tell the audience now that if you want to know more, you need to join the booths afterwards for the discussion. So uh, moving on, Abigail Gilmore, from University of Manchester, welcome. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, yeah, I'm Abby. I'm a senior lecturer in arts management and cultural policy. I've been working on the policy work strand for this project, um, and uh, I'm also a co-investigator on the Great Industries Policy and Evidence Centre. And I'm sitting in a cold bedroom with a big blue scarf around my neck. I, I'm a slightly older white woman uh, with very messy hair today, no lipstick uh, and brown eyes. And I'm looking forward to this session. Thank you. And last but absolutely not least, welcome to Sue Hayton from the University of Leeds. Sue. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sue Hayton and I'm Associate Director at the Centre for Cultural Value um, with special responsibility for policy engagement. I'm an even older white woman with white hair and glasses and I'm wearing a pale grey jumper. And the bird that you might be able to see in the picture behind me is a magpie. Thanks. Well, thank you very, very much. So. Uh, now that you've met our speakers, I'm just going to uh, just reiterate what this session is about. You've had two days of hearing some really interesting content and the results of some research. 
But what would it be if we weren't thinking about action? And so what we're now going to do, the format for this session may be slightly different to what you've had for the last two days. We've got two central questions that I'm going to ask the speakers in turn. And that each question, I really invite you, the participants, to drop your notes in the chat, drop your questions, drop your reflections, and to ask a question based on what we're doing. So two rounds of questions. This won't work without you as the participants um, taking part. And, and as we talked about, this is a title from implication to action. What now? So it is all about what are we going to do? It is a moment for all of us to self-reflect and say, this work doesn't work if we do not pull it into practicality and action. So the call to action here, and I really want you to listen, the call to action is not just for our beautiful speakers. It is also for you, the audience, the participants, because that's what makes this a collaborative experience. So I'm going to jump in. Um, and just for fairness, we're going to go in the same order every time. And it's kind of slightly quick fire. So we're going to ask the same question to all speakers. Um, and then we're going to see what you, the audience, those who have joined us, have to say. Ben, just giving you a heads up, I'm going to kick off with you. And so the first question is this. What are your key reflections on what you've heard or learnt during the conference? Thank you. This is really challenging because it has, as you say, been a really rich two days, but I've got 90 seconds. So I'm going to just go for a couple of um, ideas that I heard in, I think it was the first or the second session yesterday. Uh, so one was from uh, Vonda and this idea of compassionate leadership. And if you can't be compassionately, then don't lead, get out. Uh, and the second was was Mark Robinson's point about how important time is and this idea of really building time into our working practice and, and models and ethos. Um, and putting those two things together, I've been really thinking about regenerative practice and regenerative leadership. Um, and it's something we've been thinking about in my department, the University of Leeds, it is about regenerative research and what that might look like if we did a bit less um, I think we've all been thinking about that in the pandemic. Um, and so I wondered, you know, if, if we translated that into the cultural sector, what would it be like if we maintained the time that we've had to strategize, to, to play, to, to reflect, to evaluate, to build those networks we've been building and that we know can be so resilient, to, um, to engage with one another, to, to celebrate, um, and to rest, to regenerate, and to recuperate. And I think what we need a bit less of is production all the time, a little bit less introspection, and certainly less hidden labour. And I think that's 90 seconds. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. You've set the bar high. Over to you, Dave O'Brien. Thanks. Um, I'm going to try and go back to some of the things that, that came up uh, in the open session and have kind of bubbled away. And, and that is hearing from practitioners, people running arts organizations of how much of a kind of shock to the system the pandemic caused. And then at the same time, hearing from academic researchers and like not just me, but you know, other academic researchers who've said some variation on, we weren't very surprised that X, Y, or Z happened. And that was kind of what we'd expect given the long-term trends or given what we know about audience behavior or workforce inequalities you know the, these kinds of things um or actually even indeed things like leadership models that ben has been been talking about and it strikes me that you know the kind of the big action point or, or, or the major sort of uh, issue here is why are these two worlds not strongly connected you know why was it that i guess the academic research is in some ways comfortable saying this wasn't as much of a shock as you think it was um, whilst you know the art sector is living through what was clearly a hugely traumatic um, and, and really grim kind of upheaval so you know how do we connect those two things better so if something like this you know hopefully it never does happen again but if something like this this level of shock did happen again we wouldn't be you know in the same kind of position with these two perspectives wow thank you very very much 
Um, so uh, next, over to you, Anne. Yeah, gosh, um, so much to say. Um, I think that the, 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 the thing that I've really enjoyed is how much we've all started using the word kindness through uh, the conversations the last two days. It's been really interesting. Um, I think I came to this conversation thinking I wanted to talk about trying not to snap back into all the old ways of doing now that we've we've been forced into new positions of discomfort and then learning but I think that the biggest challenge is to snap back with kindness and I and I think there's something for sure things are going to get quite competitive we've got new funding rounds um you know there, there, there will be less there will probably be less money in the future um we're we're going to all be going back to usual and our, our usual positions um I really hope that we don't stop asking that question about what can we do for each other. Um, I really want to just take us back to Ellen Renton's beautiful poem that she gave us in the opening session. And she talked about um, being kinder to herself. And she talked about, as did uh, Cheddar Gorgeous, they both talked about not working with people anymore who didn't value them and not feeling guilty. She talked about, I just got to say it because it's an, an excuse. She talked about um, not stop, stop feeling guilty about enjoying a plume of blossom and so on so I, I really like this idea that we need to be kind to ourselves kind to each other great strand so many brilliant examples um about being more collaborative i really liked in our last session jenny from revolut and talking about we don't have to do it all alone and again not not leave, leaving that behind us um I, I really like what taj Pal had to say about um being less performative about EDI and more actionable you know these are forms of kindness to each other it's not just being nice and saying nice things it's about doing the important good things to uh, kind of to our communities I, I, so so many people have talked so eloquently about uh, the pivot to purpose I won't come back to that but there were some great really practical examples um jenny free some grant down creates that conversation about helping our colleagues or being of use of benefits to our colleagues in the education sector it was a great other conversation we had and um, to our audiences we've shown that we can be flexible we've shown that our um uh, our disabled audiences do, you know, we've shown that we can do new things, we can act in new ways that are really important to them. Um, we can accommodate all sorts of needs that we didn't know that we could. Um, let's not go back from there either. Um, somebody in our last session, Graham suggested from Big Burn Stuff, has said, let's be kind to our funders and let's encourage them to be kind to us because that allows us to be flexible and innovative. Um, but let's be kind to each other in that front, in, on that way as well. So for me, this notion of being um, kind, to, let, let's not stop asking what can we do for each other and uh, to keep that question alive. And I, and I think that um, users first and the concept of making sure that we keep time to think, to be kind to ourselves is really important. So uh, that's what it's all about for me. Thank you very, very much. And those, we've got comments coming through thick and fast and they're really agreeing with this idea of kind of a regenerative way of working, kindness, compassion. So um, anyone who's not reading those those comments and chats have a look because it's quite an interesting parlay and in, in agreement to what's being said but let me not hold up proceedings um abigail over to you thank you yeah i'm, I'm coming at this from a position of thinking about cultural participation production and policy all as situated practices that have kind contingent relationships with social structures and with economic geographies and politics of place um, and what I've been struck by is the generosity of everybody who is sharing their different personal and individual experiences and also how that shows that the pandemic has been one of this weird, the weirdest, most collective but unique set of experiences. So what I wanted to emphasise what I've heard, and I can't represent all of the many brilliant things I've heard here, was the connections between the different levels of experience between and, and, and how they sit within social structures. So thinking about the micro level and how we've heard about sensitivities to different accesses to different capitals, to time resources, to different types of taste and interest in behaviours and practices of arts consumers and the different kinds of opportunities and conditions and the economic welfare of producers. Um, I'm struck at the micro level by Tom Hodgson talking earlier about digital work, emphasising aspects of humanity and finding ways of, of, of kind of confirming humanity in the way that we deliver or, or connect with people. And I think the key act, the aspect of this is, is about connection and also about trust. So I wanted to also raise 
the issue about the meso level and how we've talked a lot about the connectivity of peer support and networks and them being very important but also the macro level and thinking about structural and systemic change uh, the triple bottom line proper pay for creatives and also perhaps a radical overhaul of funding systems uh, and affirmative action so i suppose my message from what I've learned is about not throwing away what we've learned from the pandemic and broadening out how we think about arts and culture through the eyes, ears and bodies of participants into the context of the broader creative economy and also the wider labour market and wider social structures and also in the context of everyday life. Wow, thank you very, very, very much. And Sue, over to you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I think um, what I'm going to say actually um, chimes with pretty much everything else that's been said today. I think there were two, um, uh, sorry, at this session, there were two um, phrases that really, uh, really chimed with me. Um, Mark Robinson talking about pivot to purpose and um, Cheddar Gorgeous uh, related comment about go deep or go home. Um, both of which I think um, describe what happened in the cultural sector at the start of the pandemic, a movement towards kindness and generosity that we've already uh, talked about, as well as time for reflection on the core values and purpose of organisations. That generosity in some places manifested itself through people coming together to share experience, resources and build new connections. And over the last two days, we've heard examples from places like Sandworm, where the cultural sector has come together with the local authority and other local government directorates in order to leverage greater investment and by working together, share limited resources so that they can go further. Now, this kind of approach takes vision and open leadership, a strong understanding of the place and its cultural ecosystem so that organisations and individuals are not sidelined and support for inclusive and flexible networks. I'm not advocating this approach as a panacea to the ills of the cultural sector um, and the impacts of COVID, as there are broader issues around local contexts that need to be taken into account. But the question it has raised for me is, what are the principles and values that can be taken from this hyper-local, local, regional approach that can then be rec replicated on a national stage? Thank you so much. So that was our first round of questions. And what's extraordinary to me as the chair is how all of that is interlinked, although, um, you know, you've all sort of come in independently with what your thoughts were. But it also really, really resonates with our um, audience and participate people who are here participating. And so these ideas around, um, I hope it's okay to, to read who said something, but um, Sari, uh, who is head of partnerships, has talked about, as well as kindness, the words trust and value um, have come up. And if partnership and collaboration are essential, then it's easier to work and take risks together if trust and mutual values are the base notes of the chord. And that really resonates with me with um, this idea, Sue, you were just talking about go deep or go home, and this idea of share resources and how might that link to this idea that we were talking about of kindness and how does that link to competition? As how does that link, you know, with the impending NPO rounds? Um, and I think what's beautiful for me as the chair and I'm not saying I haven't heard it before, but I've heard it more right now than I have before, is there feels to be a connection between the passion behind the research with, with the impact and the conversation that we're having in the chat. And so that connectivity between bringing research and the sector even closer together, maybe that pandemic has just drawn us more together. So. Um, I just want to put a call out. Does anyone have any questions in the audience that they have raised? I'm looking at the Q&A and I, I don't see any questions, but I would encourage anyone. Um, it's Thursday afternoon. It's like they say on the radio show. If you've never called in, now's the time. We don't bite. We're very kind. 
um, and we like the challenge as well. So it, the emojis we discovered only allow you to do we love you emojis. But if you've got something to say that will challenge us, please let us know in the chat or come and uh, have that talk with us here. But for the moment, I just want to, before we move on, I just want to ask our speakers. So I'll give you a bit of time, you know, so I'm not going to just throw it at you. Is there anything that you've heard that you're like, oh my goodness, that really resonates with me? Or, oh, I, I don't know that I quite agree with that. Just before we move on, is there anyone that's got any comments from something they've heard one of your fellow researchers say? No. I, mean, I, I can go because Abby and I have been talking about this. I think um, one of the things that we see where there is maybe a, if not a division book, but I think there are definitely conflicting perspectives, is a lot of research that is saying um, when interviewing artists and practitioners that they're very keen on universal basic income um, as a way of kind of dealing with lots of the um, working practices and, and, and pandemic issues. Um, and then I think the broader perspectives that um, some of us have been, been making in, in, in other work as, as well as within this project of saying, actually, you know, we probably want to think more in terms of a universal basic services or um, as, as kind of came up on panels earlier, you know, many of these issues around whether it's childcare or um, freelancers dealing with the tax system or, you, you know, these kind of things are to do with basically having quite a dysfunctional society and thinking about what are the most effective routes to fix in that. So, um, and I know there's there's a couple of, of points which which touch on this. And I think that's, that's really interesting because uh, I guess as a researcher in this area, I'm slightly worried that the arts might get behind a banner of universal basic income for artists. And that might mean that the kind of research questions and research conclusions that are saying many of the issues are not really to do with what it is to be an artist or a performer. They're to do with the cost of childcare or they're to do with the unemployment or the welfare system. You know, all of this kind of stuff, I, I think, is really uh, crucial. Um, and maybe that's where there's been distinctive positions that I've picked up over the course of the two days. Thank you, Dave. Is there anyone else that's got any thoughts or um, anyone in the audience but or any of the speakers that have got any more thoughts on that before we move on? Just, just to add to that, you know, it is the question of whether or not there is an exceptionalism to what we do in the cultural sector. And of course there is because culture is deeply political and powerful and that's why we have policies to regulate it as well as resource it. So I think, yeah, just to uh, agree with Dave that we we that we can't make arts and culture and the funded arts and cultural sector responsible for everything. I remember being very struck by hearing about an arts leader a couple of years ago talking about um, feeling that they felt that the communities that were disenfranchised through Brexit was somehow their fault because they hadn't done enough to bring people together. Uh, across the divide and, and so uh, we know how much culture is important to people because of the pandemic because we've been shut away from it it's been like a weird contingent valuation exercise but we can't be responsible for fixing societal problems that need to be fixed in order that arts and culture can you know be produced and consumed fairly okay before we move on i've just got a quick question i've for the speakers i've pasted it in the speaker chat so you can see it um it's come from uh, susan jones and it says resilience context differ between organizations and individuals what fosters both equally so you may want to say um if anyone wants to jump in and answer that now that's great otherwise does anyone want to, or we can leave it till we get to the longer discussion in a minute? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in because I was—I saw Maxine's point as well about resilience. Um, just very quickly to say that one thing we we talked about, you know, probably six months into the project, actually, was was the need to really reconceptualise resilience during the pandemic and, and move it, you know, very much away from uh, the rhetoric that existed pre-COVID that was that was basically about earned income. You know, the more um, mixed income model you had, the more resilient you were deemed to be. 
And of course, we saw how how false that premise was as soon as the as the, the lockdown happened, with you know performing arts affected more than any other sector, for example. So yeah, in answer to, to to Susan's question, I think one thing we have seen is that you know how well networked you were either as a as a freelancer or as an organisation, the more likely you were to survive or thrive through the pandemic. So let's I mean let's get rid of the word maybe, but at the very least let's just rethink it. Um, in, in kind of less capitalistic terms, actually, let's think about it in terms of networks and and an ecosystem and a kind of cooperation or whatever you know whatever that word is a kind of kindness and compassionate ecosystem. Oh, thank you. Um, I think also um, that that kind of links into um, issues of, of social capital and who has it and who doesn't, um, and you know, the, of course, that relates then to the education system and, and about. Um, you know the development of skills and and connections as a young person kind of growing up in this country and wanting to work within the within the sector so I think um, there are kind of broader issues aren't there which obviously that you know have already been outlined in terms of uh, you know one one um, solution is or one action is not going to provide the solution networks obviously really important but we know that, that they also exclude. Okay. All right, I'm going to, I can feel, this is how it goes, isn't it? You can feel yourself really opening up and ready for the conversation. And now I'm gonna move us on to the second question. So Ben, this is going to come up for you first and then in rotation. So as a lead researcher on this project, what one single policy change do you want to see? And what action can you personally take and for the participants and those who are joining us, you know, this really is about a call to action. And so it's only fair that we ask our speakers that question as well. So, Ben, over to you. OK, thanks. Another really hard one, isn't it? And, and mine's probably quite a boring one. And it's about data. And I'm certainly not a, a, a quant person by any stretch of the imagination. But I think, you know, we, we were kind of um, clearly when, when the pandemic hit, we, we were exposed as a sector that didn't really understand our own makeup and our infrastructure. Uh, we didn't understand the relationship between the subsidised sector and the commercial sector. And I think most importantly, we didn't understand the hugely significant vital role that freelancers and self-employed cultural practitioners play in that, in that ecology. So I think what we are, and, and this has been touched on, you know, a lot over the last two days, but I think what we really need to focus on is better and smarter data collection in the sector. We are swimming in data, but not always the right kind of data. But we really do more than ever, I think, need to know who is working in the sector, what are their relationships with each other. And as a personal pledge, um, I will continue to work with, you know, the brilliant um, quantitative uh, researchers on this team and elsewhere uh, around the UK and globally and with policymakers to try and ensure that the way we collect and analyse data is more systematic. And so if something like this ever happens again, at least we've mapped out the sector, we understand the infrastructure, and we can identify at least who cultural practitioners are. So whether or not we agree with, you know, social security system for artists, I certainly do. Um, but at least we can identify them. And if we can't identify them, we certainly can't target help towards them. So better data is my one. Thank you. And Dave, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm in a sort of similar territory to Ben. Uh, this is boring, but I, I have to repeat, you know, I always think it's a worry when we talk about, you know, one ask or, or one thing, just in case we slip into that kind of thinking of, you know, one simple trick will solve anything. But that notwithstanding, similar to Ben, um, you know, the way to solve my question about the distance between the academic and the practice or you know the, the university and, and, and the arts sector is to, to basically do more and you know do more partnership work um, and there's little things we, we've been doing not actually just with this project but with other projects in terms of things like working with arts emergency and, and kind of funding some impact uh, projects with them um, you know future possible relationships with other arts organizations and the more kind of embedded I think um, the academic research is uh, the more we've got these partnerships where research questions are come in you know sometimes from the sector asking us directly things that we can probably give answers to quite quickly but you know equally um the academics kind of you know throwing back 
um, insights. Um, I hesitate to say better knowledge exchange because there are lots of there's lots of baggage, you know, with with, with those frameworks. But certainly, um, I'll be trying to do more uh, of these kind of partnerships uh, over the course of the next uh, few months and years. Thank you, um, Anne. <clears throat> oh, a bit of a quandary here because I was about to say pretty much exactly the same thing that Dave has just said, but with different words. Uh, but I think, but I, and really just um, picking up on a comment that somebody's made uh, higher up actually in the chat, just talking about um, the closeness between researchers, the sector, and policymakers, and how, you know, in a way, having worked much more closely over this period, it has helped us to respond you know respond use the data quicker in the way that we respond and i think being more sure-footed sure in the way that we've um, interpreted uh the data as it's coming at us kind of thing you know so so i would i would echo that i think if i had to have a new one it would just be something around enshrining the idea of users first in the way that we plan the change so for me that is a little bit about data you need data to help you to do that you need great quality of data to help you to do that and you need to know how to have a totally empathetic um, and mutually respectful relationship with your users, whoever they may be. So I would love to see that embedded in the way that um, funding and um, approval of the establishment is handed over. And um, what I would I do, uh, I, there are things that I can contribute to that personally and, 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 and I will try, but I haven't got time to say what they are. Okay, thank you, um, Abby. Um, yeah, thanks, Dave, for stealing the thunder. Um, yeah, I think I, I we talked yesterday and a bit today about kind of um, allocating resources to uh, to places and to, to support kind of partnerships and peer networks and so on. And so I just want to reiterate that in terms of thinking about how interventions might be systemic, but at that kind of meso level, um, and really about supporting those people who can to become public servants of places, whether they're local authorities or community organisations or arts and cultural organisations or private partners or whoever, individual citizens. Um, so I would just, um, I'm interested in continuing to co do collective work, collaborative work together, um, but particularly thinking, of, I'm just going to carry on banging on about the local basically and how important it is to understand that in the context of national policies and to try to promote uh, better ways of having shared structures for national local working. Um, uh, and I think we've learned a lot about that from uh, a lot we've been talking about today. And I think the pandemic has taught us that inadvertently. So what can I do? I will continue to work in this area in terms of my research activities and I will want to continue to work in very close partnership and co-designed wherever possible. Um, and to engage with policymakers on a local and national level, um, but in a clear and achievable way. And I'm not so bothered about my ref in, uh, outputs. I'm more interested in what my research activities can do um, to support collaboration. Thank you. And over to the lovely Sue, please. Thanks. Um, yeah, I don't uh, disagree with anything that's been said. Um, I just, I suppose, um, and also I was going to say quite a lot of it. Um, so I'm going to talk about the things that um, perhaps are, are a little bit different to what's already been said. Um, and I think um, one of the things, uh, you know, that we have, have touched on is that kind of cross-departmental approach. Um, and kind of bringing culture under the purview of education, health, business and communities, um, uh, you know, long term aim. Um, but in terms of um, uh, being pragmatic and also thinking about um, kind of organisational and individual agency, perhaps most importantly, uh, the sector itself has to take responsibility for and action around the change it wants to see. Um, so on that note, uh, what, I, what will I do? Um, within my role at Centre for Cultural Value, I'll push to develop those cross-departmental relationships. It will take time, but it's worth doing. Um, and in my role as a trustee of a voluntary arts organisation, um, I'll encourage uh, the board and, and uh, volunteers to actually take a much more planned approach to 
uh, to device, diversifying our membership and audience. Thank you. Um, it is just about five past four. So we have, if my maths are right, we have to about 20 past to continue this conversation and questions are beginning to come through. Um, there's a question that's come up from, um, I think, is it Jose? If I'm mispronouncing your name, I'm very sorry. Um, and um, But I'm gonna read the question out. It said, um, following Ben's comment on data, as an analyst in DCMS that was involved in the modeling that underpinned the CRF fund, what can we do to improve data, particularly at sub-sector level, as they sometimes have they sometimes face different realities. So I'm going to open that up to any of the speakers to jump in um, and give their thoughts. I mean, I, I have a couple of very brief ones, which is coordination it is really important. Um, I think Ben has, has, has mentioned um, a couple of times in, in, in some of the, the sessions around this being for you know some researchers the first time that they kind of dealt with DCMS and the, the first time they felt um, that the analysts were you know were, were kind of approaching them or, or interested, whereas you know I guess kind of other other of us in in particular policy spaces were were sort of used to that and those possibilities for collaboration feed into coordinating where you know people might be working with data sets that are useful that you know others don't know about that sort of stuff. And then it's it's like a massive cliche, but I think the exploitation of what we've already got and spending more resource trying to kind of, you know, sweat our assets a bit better, it, it was really noticeable that for all of the kind of problems and limitations of what you can get from the ONS and from the UK uh, data service, there's just incredible amounts of, of data about the cultural and creative sector that for sort of complicated historical and Sue had mentioned, you know, departmental or disciplinary reasons ju just don't get researched and, and don't get done. Um, so yeah, I, I, th I think there are, you know, sort of coordination, but but also um, using what, what we've got already a bit better. I mean, I, if you want to pay to commission whole new swathes of surveys uh, and qual research, obviously the researchers would be delighted if DCMS does that, but it does strike me that there's still a lot that's kind of underexplored at the moment. Okay. Can I just follow on quickly, just, just to say that we, we actually are doing this work at the Centre for Cultural Value, and hopefully one of one of my colleagues can post a link in the chat to our Making Data Work project. But we're, we're working with certainly all of the arm's length bodies at the moment, all of the cultural arm's length bodies in England, um, and trying to kind of co-develop a data framework um, working with partly with DCMS, partly with the Leeds Institute for Data Analytics, and really looking at, you know, what what data is being collected. So a bit of an audit. Uh, what are the gaps? So someone made the point earlier today about, you know, it would be useful to know about um, how many parents and carers we have in cultural organisations, for example. Diversity data in, say, dance. You know, we don't have all the data at the nuanced level that we need. So hopefully, watch this space by the end of the year we'll have at least the outlines for a kind of cultural sector data framework. And then I think, you know, as Dave says, what we really need is, is something like a kind of cultural data observatory where we can really open up this research to really interesting analysis and, you know, cross analysis would say public health data. Thank you. Um, so uh, I've got a question that's come, come in which uh, really resonates with me personally. I don't know that I can call myself an academic um, and I'm relatively new and I've come across from another sector. So um, I think this is a, a really interesting question and it's from uh, Jennifer, I, I can't read your second name, um, but the question says, can the panel demystify how cultural organizations who have an idea for a research project, but not the skills or capacity to execute, can get involved with universities, researchers to jointly conduct the research. And, you know, apart from my own passion for that, I think 
you know, we as speakers and me as a chair, this, we know this, but just looking at some of our attendees, this is such a good question because we've just been talking about brokering those relationships, but actually, how do you start them? So um, I'll open that to, to, to any or all of you. I can jump in very quickly to say we actually have the perfect fund um, through the Centre for Cultural Value. And again, someone will post a link in the chat, but, but our Collaborate Fund is very much about um, matching uh, cultural organisations with academic researchers to really kind of hone or fine tune a research question uh, and then supporting you through a whole year long process to take that piece of, of action research through to fruition. Um, closing date is, I think, next week, so you'll have to move fast. But also on, on our Culture Hive platform, there are lots of resources about how to work with academic partners, how to build partnerships, how to develop research questions. Um, so, yeah, do look at our resources and we'll be having another round of this funding this time next year. Um, so, so it's something that we know is a real problem. It's something, again, that's, uh, that's cropped up a few times in the last two days. Um, we can make so much more progress, I think, working in partnership than we can on our own. I think academics have a lot to learn about how to be more humble. Uh, as Abby said, you know, less kind of focused on publishing and ref and more on genuine impact. Um, but yeah, have a look at our resources and hopefully there'll be some useful answers there. Thank you. Um, I'm really cognizant of time and I think that was such a full answer um and yes if anybody could put the link in to the collaborate fund uh, that would be great and even just i suggest there's a video there I, I think that tells you about it even if you're not ready for next week that's going to give you a really good insight as someone who's watched it several times that's going to give you a really good insight into what those partnerships could look like and the thing that i would say is if i've got one skill in life so i'm not really scared of asking stupid questions because there is no such thing as a stupid question so just reach out um you know if you want to know how to make those partnerships drop someone an email just say look got no idea I've got I've got no idea of how to do it but I've got this initial idea can we have a chat and I think you'll find certainly I can't speak for all academics but certainly with this panel here some of whom I know personally they will at some point try and make that time to have those conversations and that's often how the best partnerships start they start with an email that's not centered on any on an emergency for right now so not going to be able to find funding like for next week, as we all know, but but those conversations can build quite quickly. But as I say, that collaborate fund, not to push the fund. I have no vested interest in it, but it's a really good example of a space where you can watch the video, have a read of the guidelines. And it really is written in very good, plain English. So um, I've got two questions and then we're moving. We're at 14 minutes past. So the two questions I think are probably slightly linked right um is the first one is from our very own daniela and she says how can we be realistic about how much we can change in the arts ambition is great but do we maybe need to go more protests instead of writing audience development plans so that's a question but i also want to add a bit to that and when we're being realistic how good might it be to be realistic in terms of kindness, in terms of working strategically? So I'll bundle those bits up together and and uh, open that up to the speakers. Um, Suzanne, I, I, I can, I, I'm happy to, um, I'm not sure that I'm speaking to about realism, I'm talking about uh, protests and audience development plans or otherwise I think um, I mean I think I want to just address that question it's like I mean I think um, you know nothing against protesting and uh, more, the more of it the merrier see you there um, but I don't see quite what the connection between that and an audience development plan is I mean I think that the reality of an audience development plan that says you know what you're actually going to do with your resources when you look at who your audience really is with some proper data and you say what your intentions are and you put your money where your mouth is and your actions where your mouth is um, to my mind uh, feels like a uh, that uh, that is a very very necessary thing and actually protests might inform how you do it but actually that is that the intentions change rather than uh, um, talking about it so that's my sense thank you has anyone else got anything to add into that 
No. Um, I mean, I, I, I agree with your observation of the question. I suppose as a chair, what I might say is that um, sometimes the ambition like, is great, um, but actually in order to be able to develop those, those plans, you do need the support and that might take the protest to actually give you the space and the time. So one of the challenges is you're trying to change and change and develop and bring in more audiences, but you do need a certain amount of framework to allow you to do that. But the other question that I thought was kind of linked in a slightly the way my brain works is how do we counter in brackets resist the so-called culture wars um, and support colleagues targeted by these narratives. And I suppose that really links into this idea of kindness, collaboration, in terms of the ambition of the sector, um, in terms of inclusivity. Um, how do we do that? Um, and I, I open that up and it's ever so slightly maybe off topic, but I feel like we can't really do the work that you've been talking about if people are living in fear around culture wars. So yes, I'll open that up to anybody. Can I just come in from the perspective again of, the, of an academic who, uh, as I put in the chat, has privilege in order to, uh, to have a voice in, in this area and to be critical. Um, and so I think that what we can do is work together to maintain critical activist voices in whatever way we can, whether that's at our own institutions or at policy. Um, and, and, and yeah, and, and just kind of act collectively to, to we have to do it in house too. we have to think about this in terms of global kind of constraints there are things like the hong kong security law that means that it makes it very difficult for some of our student international students to talk critically and um, there is fear um, there's fear about raising your head again above the parapet and and so i think you know it is back to back collaboration and collectivism it's, sorry it's packed and pithy but um yeah i think we have to use our privilege in order to to to, to speak critically and to use the resources that we might have and also to know when to step aside actually and allow other people to have their voice spoken and on that point i'm going to step aside now thank you does anyone else have any thoughts i mean did, the only thing I'd, I'd add to what abby said very quickly is I'd, I'd actually split that question up into two and say Supporting colleagues is, is crucial and, you know, using everything we can, every sort of, you know, instrument at our disposal, whether it's, you know, things like employment law, whether it's, you know, institutional resources, whether it's things like unions and, you know, kind of support around the employment context. The, the thing I, I guess I'm more kind of cautious with, not more cautious than Abby, but, you know, more cautious in terms of the question is the idea of kind of countering and resisting culture wars. And it strikes me that you know, we have platforms that are driven by attention and engagement, and they reward attention and engagement. Um, and there are definitely circumstances where attention and engagement are really crucial, but there are also circumstances where it's clear that attention and engagement actually fuels, allows, enables, um, you know, both platforms to kind of thrive, but also the precise kind of countering or resisting to fail because all you're doing is kind of you know giving more attention to particular positions it, it's tricky to know you know the difference between the two and, and to know the difference between you know when something needs to be kind of countered and resisted and when you know something needs to be ignored but i do think and not to kind of you know overly politicize it a lot of the kind of noise that we get from central government and you know seemingly we're going to get from the uh, Secretary of, of State for Culture at the moment is something that we're better off kind of ignoring um, and thinking in terms of, you know, what's going on in terms of, say, um, legal or regulatory interventions rather than daft tweets um, because it's, you know, legal regulations and funding settlements and, you know, who is on boards and stuff like this where the action is really going to happen rather than the kind of minute to minute 
um, sort of social media stuff. That's not to say this stuff isn't important. It is, but I do think there's you know there's definitely kind of um, wariness. We should you know be cautious about rewarding platforms and rewarding the attention economy. I just make a, a really quick pragmatic point as well that someone someone made in the last session. Um, and I think there's a real role for training and development here. I think a lot of cultural organisations, digital engagement in practice is run, as someone pointed out, by interns or by very early career marketing officers. Um, and we really need to you know, upskill ourselves in how to safeguard people online, artists that we work with, colleagues. You know, there's a lot of naivety, I think, around digital engagement at the moment where we're uh, not particularly skilled compared to other sectors in this. And I think we're really at risk of exposing our partners, colleagues and artists, unless we have a lot of very quick uh, training and development. Wow, thank you very much. I'm going to um, jump in and say that it is 21 minutes past four. How did that time pass so quickly? Um, there are lots more questions. And what I do suggest is that um, once this session closes, then there's, a, I think, a 30 minute opportunity to talk together in the booth section. And if I'm not right, then um, uh, Daniela or, or Fanny, can you put where people can meet after this? Um, I'm going to do a, a, a probably a very poor attempt at summing up. And I think the word that I would leave you with as the chair, the things that I've heard is really all of this has to be interconnected. This idea of research and the sector working together, but who's involved, who's involved in the research? Because then that idea of protection means it's probably slightly easier because the very people that we may be trying to protect are part of that research and they are getting to ask what questions we want to ask. But at the same time, how do we do all of that with kindness? How do we learn from the pandemic um, and try and work in a way that is probably better overall for our health? So that idea of interconnectedness. Um, the bit that I, I always really, really enjoy, which is the thank you. You know, you get asked to come and share something and yes, it, it's a gig, right? It's a paid gig. But people always forget that you have the absolute privilege of the prep and of talking to the speakers and then hearing them. So I really, really, from my heart, want to thank the speakers, not just for what they've said today and over the last two days, but for the research that they've done, for the passion that they've shown, and actually for the humanity that is so clearly injected into the work. So um, in order, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you, Sue. Um, I also, as we're rounding up, want to do, and I'm going to hand over to Ben to give the final closing, but thank you to the organisers and the behind the scenes team who have been extraordinarily patient. They've been really thorough um, and they've certainly helped people like me who may not be as tech savvy as I should do. They've been very patient in making sure that we're here and we keep to time. We really hope that you've enjoyed the conference and look forward to your feedback. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank our live captioner, Trish. Um, and uh, again, a big thanks to the speakers. I'm going to hand over to Ben now um, to do the final words for the conference itself. Thanks, Suzanne, and, and thank you to you for being such a wonderful chair. It was a really difficult session to plan because we had very little time um, in terms of 90 seconds each, and we didn't know how many questions had come up from the audience. So thank you for being so so flexible and uh, keeping us to time so brilliantly. Um, I, I've got a few thank yous. Um, first of all, of course, a huge thank you to all of you for coming along. We, we, were, we haven't charged for an event before, um, and we kind of had to this time because the, the beautiful Airmeet uh, platform was a lot more expensive than we thought it would be. But we thought it would give you a, you know, a much more immersive experience. And I hope you'll agree, despite the, the occasional technical hitch, that it is, you know, it does offer opportunities that certainly Zoom doesn't. So thank you for coming along. Thank you for oh, just the brilliant engagement. It really has felt um, as, as Suzanne was just saying that we've almost, you know, we're creating this community, aren't we, of researchers, cultural practitioners, organisations, funders and policy makers and starting at least to have these really these grown up conversations that are really honest and kind 
uh, and generous and i think we're making progress so so thank you for coming along it's been a great two days certainly from from our perspective um i'd just like to thank the funders again we wouldn't be here without them so thank you to ukri for funding the project and the arts and humanities research council also to paul hamlin foundation and arts council england who fund the center for cultural value um, and massive thank you to all of the chairs. Um, you know, it is a huge job. It's very difficult, isn't it? Chairing sessions online, keeping your eye on, you know, the Q and A's and the chat and the room and the backstage uh, noise that's all going on. It's much harder, I think, than chairing an online, a face-to-face -face session. So thank you to all of you, to the wonderful speakers, and of course, to the brilliant research team, all of whom have participated over the last two days. Um, especially our brilliant postdoc researchers who've spent in done, done the lion's share of the work on this project. So um, a massive thank you to all of you. Um, very quickly, just to, to uh, echo Suzanne's thanks to the conference organisers, to um, Tamsin and Alex particularly, who've spent you know weeks uh, thinking about and planning for this conference, and to Daniela and Fanny, who've kept us all uh, in order in terms of prepping the sessions and uh, keeping these two two days working as smoothly as they have. Um, huge thanks to Trish. I don't know how you've kept up with people who speak even faster than than I do. And, and Tarajani is certainly one of them. Um, so you've done, a, you've done a sterling job and we're really, really grateful. And it'll help us to gather all of the resources together and send it out to, to all of you and as education packs to student groups, et cetera, as well. Please get in touch with us if you would like um, anything uh, of that nature. Um, a final call to drop into um, Fraz Island, our composer in residence booth. I think it's still open. If not, um, Tamsin will correct me in the chat. Either way, I think you can probably drop in and see um, what Fraz has been up to. Uh, I know that, that Fraz is planning to create a conference soundscape. We thought we'd like to do something um, quite creative as part of the conference. So there will be a soundscape and a blog that we will be sending out to all of you in December that hopefully really captures the, the conference in a creative and artistic spirit. Uh, we've, we've posted this a few times, but we will be summarizing. I imagine it's a really, a really Herculean task, but we're trying at the moment behind the scenes to summarize all of this 15 months of research into um, a kind of 50 page maximum report, don't worry, it won't all be words, there'll be there'll be visuals and infographics apparently, and lots of images too. Um, but that'll be out in January. Again, if you sign up to our mailing list, uh, most of you probably automatically have by joining the conference, but if you haven't, please do. Uh, and then we'll be able to send you a PDF of the report. Um, finally, please do keep in touch. Um, again, as Suzanne said, you know, we've all pledged today to, to make a positive change and not just to make this a talking shop. So let's try and, I don't know, write that pledge down and try and make it happen over the next year or so. And finally, yes, uh, the, the uh, lounge, I think it is, is open for the next 30 minutes. So, you know, grab a cup of tea, um, I had my eye on Oliver Mantel's gin bar um, in his, I was very jealous of his backdrop, which is better than my dance hall blue with no gin. So grab whatever your poison is and please do join us for an informal debrief chat, whatever you want to call it, um, decoding, post-match analysis, and we'll be there until five o'clock. But thank you very much for now. Hopefully see you in the lounge. If not, thanks again for coming and we'll hopefully see you at the Centre for Cultural Value very soon. Bye everyone.